The pea coat, also known as the urine coat. What's up YouTube, this is Michael, and today this video is gonna be split into three different, four different sections, all of which will be very serious, because last time I made a post in the Fedora Lounge, someone said, too silly for me. So none of that, full on business and I'm gonna post this in the Fedora Lounge. I'll let you know my results. So anyways, today we are talking about the best pea coat ever. Honestly, I know someone's gonna say, what about this pea coat or that pea coat? But something I consider is price is also a function of the jacket sometimes. And I paid $60 for this jacket when something that could stand up to it is usually like 300, 400, or like 150 used or something like that. This is used, but still. So just kind of wanted to get that out of the way. I also need to get this out of the way. Hey, it's B-roll Mike. This pea coat doesn't fit me, so I'm gonna keep on putting clothes on until it does. So far, we're starting out in a t-shirt. Too big. Someone sent it to me while well, I bought it on eBay. They said it was a size 38. This is like a 42 or 44, so. I am giving it away to Taylor's brother. I almost said Taylor's boyfriend. Would hate if she had another boyfriend. But yeah, I am giving it away. If it doesn't fit him, I will post it on this channel and be like, who wants it? And I'll just ship it to you because I got my money back from the eBay seller, so don't worry. Also, real quick, since this doesn't fit, I obviously will be doing that, but I have some old clips when I had a size 38 pea coat. Okay, pea coat is on, freshly urinated. You'll have to ignore the fact that in college, I thought the, the joke was with pea coats that you had to pee on them in order for them to be warm. So I really rode that joke to death. So as long as you can deal with that, you can see how it actually fits. Wow, stocks are just bombing today. Okay, so anyways, we're gonna split this video up into four different parts. Let me tell you those four parts now. One, how do I identify this particular pea coat? This one is from World War II, but also early 50s to I think also late 50s pea coats are also great. They are A1 steak sauce. Two, fit. That'll be a little tricky because this jacket doesn't fit. This will help a little bit, but also I have footage, like I said, don't stress out. Three, something that makes this jacket such a standout is the wool type, and then we'll go over the details a little bit. Pretty standard pea coat, so nothing will shock you. Maybe. And then four, my favorite part, we will go over the two coolest features of a pea coat. One of them I just found out, and the second one changed the way I look at wool coats in general. So. I look like that cartoon. I forget the cartoon Steve Carell plays him, but I look like him. Okay, so first things first. The pea coats that I like specifically range from the 40s to the 50s. That era, to me, is a golden time for naval US pea coats. Also, if you are looking for a modern pea coat that is still the same quality as an old US Navy pea coat, I suggest looking at Shot. There's also Sterling Wear. There's Real McCoys, but that's like a thousand dollar pea coat. So if you got big bucks, I definitely recommend that one. That is an insane pea coat. It's like 37 ounces. And then lastly, if you want to get a little funky, check out Mr. Freedom. Mr. Freedom makes really cool stuff. They have a, a very heavy denim pea coat that I want to get one day. But also, that's a big bank. I don't have that big bank. Like I said, the stocks today. So what I look for to identify these jackets the easiest way is the stitching near the cuff. There's two things I look for. Stitching three inches above the cuff and stitching one inch above the cuff. The three inches above the cuff are 40s, World War II. One inch above the cuff is 50s, World War III. I don't know. Maybe a chili war, could be. That's the first thing I look for, and usually, honestly, sometimes the only thing I look for. I actually found one of these pea coats in the women's section at Savers for $3, and I didn't buy it, because I already had one. That was the dumbest thing I've ever did. I could have made $57. Another thing to look for is, in the 40s, they had eight buttons on the pea coat. In the 50s, they had six buttons. There's also a navel tag stitched on the inside of pea coats that you can use to date them. There's a great article in the Fedora Lounge that I read while I was being mercilessly bullied by them. That's a great article that I'll put in the description. If I forget, just someone comment, hey, Mike, I love the video, but you forgot to put the link in the description. Maybe hop on that, bud. Smiley face. If you don't include the smiley face, I'll block you. Also, real quick, you should definitely subscribe, like this video, follow me on Instagram. I think there's usually four that I do. Comment, you should definitely comment. Okay, so that's how you find one of these pea coats. I suggest eBay, and this is what I do. I look up Kersey Wool Pea Coat. Then I look up 1940s pea coat. Then I look up 1950s pea coat. Then I look up World War II pea coat. I do those four things separately. I look through every listing. Sometimes I'll add the size. So I'll say 38 or small or something like that. But usually when it comes to eBay, you're looking for the person that doesn't know, they just know that's a pea coat and they type in old pea coat or something like that. That's where I usually find the best deals. So you really have to comb through like a thousand jackets to find the best one.
I'm going to be the master. I'm going to be a master of this guy. I know just a single sweatshirt wouldn't fix the situation. So we're gonna then put on my favorite denim jacket. Also, I don't know if you could see it. I have a secret pin here. Oh, that may be it. Okay, so point two, sizing. Like I said, a little difficult. Here is the first shot of me wearing it. Pea coat is on, freshly urinated, and uh, we're ready to go outside. It's currently 33 degrees outside, so good test. So these are very slim fit jackets, which is one of the reasons why I think they're the best because that's kind of the fit that I'm going for. I recommend true to size. I definitely don't recommend going one size down. You probably won't be able to hug your child. And one size up, you can do if you're gonna put a lot of stuff under it, but keep in mind that these shoulders are stiff. They're not shoulder pads, but they will stick out and make you look like me. Wool types, which is one of the most interesting thing about the World War II peacoats, and just peacoats in general. Wool type is obviously the most important part of the jacket. That's the engine, that's the outside, that's the inside, that's the tires of the jacket. That was the worst analogy I could have ever thought of. I like 1940s and 1950s peacoats because they use kersey wool, which we'll get into in a second. They later transitioned to Melton wool, which we will also get into in a second, but those are two different wool types, and we'll talk about those broad, and then I'll zero in on them. So button your knickerbockers. There's this debate. It's really not a heavy debate. There's probably five people talking about it on the internet, but kersey wool versus melton wool. For the most part, what I can find is that they're the same, but the big difference was when you look at the 60s and 70s and stuff like that, the weight of the wool changed. So you measure garments in weight, where I think it's a square yard, and you have an ounce number, so 32 ounces, is a square yard of this fabric weighs 32 ounces. When you're talking pea coats or just winter gear in general, you typically want a higher number. If you see a 14 ounce wool pea coat, that's pretty flimsy. But the big debate was, is Kersey warmer than Melton? And I have no information on if you have a 32 ounce Kersey fabric and a 32 ounce Melton fabric, how they're gonna perform differently, I don't know. I assume Kersey will always be a little bit warmer and a little bit more wind resistant just because it's a tighter weave, but I don't know that for sure. What I do know is that um, as the peacoats transition from kersey wool to melton wool, the original melton wool weight was 32 ounces, which is a very hefty weight for wool that is a very thick jacket. And I think that was on par for warmth. But quickly, US Navy jackets went down in wool weight, I think to 24, which is then there was a big difference. So people were saying the jackets weren't as warm, they weren't built as well, they weren't as water resistant. That's all true when it's a lesser weight, but I think when it comes to the original wool, Melton wool pea coat, I think that baseline is the same. So again, I don't know this part for sure, but I think Kersey wool is a little bit lighter than 32 ounce Melton wool, but the way that it's produced makes it the same warmth or maybe even a little warmer. Not 100% positive about that. Kersey wool was made in 11th century Britain, so if you're really curious, you can just go and ask them. So when we're comparing Kersey to Melton wool, what you'll see right away is that they are finished differently or they're just, they're woven differently so they look different. Kersey wool is extremely smooth and has a lot more rigidity to it. Melton wool is a little bit rougher and isn't that rigid. It looks a little bit softer. Although when you get to 37 ounces or 32 ounces, it's also pretty stiff. A lot of material to be packing. Other than that, like I said, there's not a lot of information about it. You can see the difference here. The big thing is that I think the presentation of a Kersey wool Pico is a lot better. It has a little bit more stiffness to it, so it looks a little bit more structured. If you look at the wool, it almost looks like a board of like some other material that's not a fabric. It looks a little stiffer, which I really like. It looks like you can shave the wool down, not like it would fray everywhere. And I know if I'm getting a Kersey wool Pico, I know it's built like a tank. Other than that though, the lining of this jacket is rayon, which is a semi-synthetic material because it's made of wood pulp, but the wood pulp is chemically treated in order to become rayon. I thought it was made in the 60s, turns out it was made in 1846, so I got the six right. This is usually the first thing that goes on these jackets. You can see mine's a little ripped up, a little gross, but if this was my jacket and I wasn't giving it to Taylor's, well, maybe I'll do it for Taylor's brother's birthday. I would replace the lining with something cool. It could be nylon or something like that, but I would make it a cool color or a cool print or something like that, because that would be really cool. 1940s pea coat that fits great and has a crazy lining. I hope to one day make the Iron Snail its own clothing brand. This is the face I make right before I write down an idea. Brilliant one, Mike. Other than that though, like I said, it has buttons. As you can see, the name of the person that originally owned this jacket is stamped on the rayon lining, which is pretty cool. Maybe, oh, it'd be so cool if I framed that portion. 
Michael, write that down. But the other part is that there's corduroy pockets, which is great. Corduroy is still a cotton, so it doesn't add a lot of insulation or anything like that. But compared to like a canvas lined pocket, one, it feels nicer, and two, there is a little loft. So I think that will probably add a little bit more warmth for your fingies. Okay, cool. Current layer, t-shirt, sweatshirt, denim jacket, another sweatshirt. Ugh, this pin, as nice as it is, I feel like this will be how I poetically die. Okay. Ugh. All right, I think that's it. That's a little easier than I thought. Also, can't really bend my arms that well. Okay, and finally, the two coolest features of this jacket. Like I said, one of them changed my life forever. The second one I found out today, and I was like, oh, that's incredible. But the first one is that the reason you can button a peacoat from two different sides, so you can button it from the right or the left, is because a sailor, when they were out to sea, the wind was blowing in one direction, so they could button the peacoat to face against the wind, so that way the wind wouldn't sneak through the buttons and make them cold. I don't know how much that actually came into effect because I'm assuming for the most part the sailor was moving and changing directions and I doubt every time he moved he was like, oh, one second, and had to rebutton it and was like, sorry sir, hold on, I'll load the cannons in a second. I don't know anything about the Navy, but I'm assuming there are some times where you stand still for a long period of time. And then that comes in handy. It's really cool to think about that. And the second thing is the reason peacoat collars are so big is because you can pop them up. And obviously you can pop up any collar, but peacoats are made to be popped up to keep you warm. So if it's really windy or cold or anything like that, they go up really high. There's also a ton of stitching on the collar, so it is rigid enough to stand up. And there's a little throat latch to secure the collar and make it a little bit tighter. It does what I call the full cone full-on cone, put you into the full cone. There's nothing better than being inside of the full cone, especially when it's windy and you can slowly shrink inside of your full cone and not feel it. That, when I first saw that with a Pico or just like kind of read about that's what they were for, I was like, okay, that has to be on every jacket ever that I buy, because that's incredible. That's actually why I would rather a Woolrich Mackinac over some Filsons, because the collar on some Filson Mackinacs is small, so it doesn't really do anything when you pop it up. But an old Woolrich jacket, you could pop right up to your ears, cinch it, and just be on your way. But yeah, so anyways, that's about it. Thanks for coming. I'll see you next week.